Hey everyone, it's Jeannie Walters and here we are. It's Friday, July 10th, another Friday, which means another Experience Investigators Ask Me Anything webinar. This week, we will be talking about three problems that journey mapping can help you solve. And then as always, we will open it up to questions as, from you as well. So as you join us here, we love hearing from where, where you are. We love hearing about where you're from and where you are, I should say. And so let us know where you're joining us from and let us know if you have some great weekend plans. Uh, I'm actually going to be heading off on a little time off, so I'm excited about that. And uh, a little about me, let's see. Now, are we seeing the screen? Let me do this. There we go. Okay, so uh, as we go into this topic, if you have never been here or if you have, uh, a little about me, I'm Jeannie Walters. I've been doing this type of customer experience work for about 20 years. And I uh, lately have been doing a lot of video things, as you can imagine, we all are. This is how we're communicating now. And so I've been uh, conducting training and workshops and things like that with clients, which is really fun. And I'm also doing a lot of coaching as well. So if your team is looking for different ways to interact, those are a few ways. I also have a couple of courses on LinkedIn learning, so feel free to check those out as well. But I'm very happy you're here. And just as a reminder, we do this most Fridays. And I say most because there are the occasions where we have to switch things around for schedules. We've shown up on Thursdays uh, occasionally. We also are, uh, you know, next week I will be actually off taking some time off, which I encourage all of you to do. Uh, but we will still have some programming for you. So stay tuned on that. And if you are watching this on replay, feel, feel free to ask those questions because I will do my best to respond to them. If you're here with us live, drop those questions, anything really that you have to ask into the chat and or uh, wherever you are. And David, who is here with us, as always, will be helping facilitate those questions. So hi, David. Hey, everybody. Happy yeah. almost weekend. Seriously. <laughs> And so where are people joining us from? Um, well, Jeannie, you never asked. And so nobody has told us. I did ask. I did ask. Tell us in the chat. Tell um, us where you're joining us from. You know what, Jeannie? This is actually completely my fault. I apologize. Um, we are broadcasting exclusively to YouTube live right now. Um, I have not added the LinkedIn live feed. So I'm going to add us. I'm going to see if we can do this live right now. <laughs> I think we can. This is what happens when you're live, right? Yeah. We are going live on LinkedIn right now. Excellent. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. So everybody on YouTube got a little bonus introduction. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's Jeannie Walters. We're going to do it again. Uh, <laughs> it's another Friday, which means it's another Ask Me Anything webinar. And uh, I am here talking today about some of the things that journey mapping can help you solve. But if you would like to ask questions, please feel free to drop those into the chat at any time. And I will answer those after the short presentation. Uh, also, if you are joining us right now, we love hearing about where you're joining us from. We usually have a global crowd, which is really fun to see. So go ahead and drop that into the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from and what sort of weekend plans you have. We're always interested in that. And uh, just so you know who I am, I am Jeannie Walters. I've been doing customer experience work for about 20 years. And lately, as you can imagine, I'm doing a lot of that uh, virtually like this. So I've been doing a lot of training virtually, workshops, as well as coaching for clients around the world. And uh, I also have several courses on LinkedIn Learning that I encourage you to check out. We can drop some links out that help you get access to those uh, for free. So we will try to do that as well. And just as a reminder, we are here most Fridays. Uh, every once in a while, we have to move things around. We've shown up on Thursdays. You guys have been really game about joining us on different days, which we really appreciate. Next week, I'm actually taking some time off. And so uh, we won't be doing this live live, but we'll still have programming. So stay tuned for that. I think you'll like it. 
And as always, if you have any questions, drop them in. That's why we're here. We're here to answer your questions. If you are watching the replay, feel free to do that too, because I will do my best to go back and answer those as well. And as always, we have David with us. David Hornreich, our director of marketing is here and he will be helping us facilitate and uh, keeping the train moving, I guess. <laughs> That's right, keeping it moving forward. Um, so Saptarshi is here. Saptarshi, Yay. always great to see you uh, in India. We've got Tyler still in Lakewood, um, who says he's got twin toddlers. So his only weekend plans is to survive them. Oh my goodness. I like that. <laughs> Um, we've got Sophia from Stockholm, Luis from Scotland, uh, Sarbjeet in San Francisco, uh, a couple of folks from San Francisco. We've also got Hayward, California. So the Bay Area is represented today. Nice. Um, nice. Raleigh, North Carolina. So once again, folks from all over, happy you're here. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. It's always fun to see where people are joining us from. And uh, it's fun to see some familiar faces, people who have shown up week after week, as well as some folks that I've had the opportunity to work with in different capacities. They're showing up here. So it's really nice to see you all. And as always, we appreciate you being here and your engagement and your support and your dedication to your customers, because that's what this is all about. This is all about making sure that we're showing up and providing the best experiences we can for our customers. And in today's world, I think we all need that. We need some better experiences. So thank you for that. So I think I'm going to jump in now to our topic and then we will get to questions at the end. Feel free to continue to use that chat and let us know. And you know what? You guys are experts as well. So feel free to add to this discussion as well. So let's talk about journey mapping. When I tell you to stop for a minute and imagine a customer journey map, what do you see in your mind? Many of us probably see visuals. We see the charts with, you know, kind of the waves of emotion, the ups and downs. Some journey maps are highly visual. They have lots of emojis on them. They have different ways to express those moments of truth. Maybe you see something that you've done in your own organization with a I've seen it done with spreadsheets, with PowerPoint, with some low tech options. I mean, I'm a big fan of post-it notes, right? That's how most journey maps start with post-it notes all over the wall. But once we get to that map deliverable, I think sometimes that's when things lose their magic a little bit. And that may sound a little odd, but because I'm a big fan of mapping, but I like to think about it as an action, as a verb. So when you get right down to it, journey mapping is the tool. It's not so much about the map. It's about the act of going through that, of flipping the script and understanding your customer's journey and understanding the experience they're having so that you can provide better outcomes for them. You can reduce that effort. You can create more ease for them as they go through the journey. That's the outcome we're looking for, not the actual map. And so when we talk about journey mapping within our organizations, we really need to look at it as a tool. And yet, if I tell you, you know, to use a tool for something, and I'm not specific about what tool to use or how to use it, that's hard to understand. And in fact, I had, I was in England several years ago, and somebody asked me for a spanner because they were doing some work in the hotel. Uh, there was an issue in my room and they came in to fix something. And he said, can you hand me the spanner? And I literally had no idea what that meant because uh, in our world, we call that a wrench. I think that's right, right? Wrench, spanner. Those of you in the UK, tell me if I got that right. Uh, and so I literally didn't understand what tool he was asking for. So there was no way for me to provide that. I think the same thing happens with journey mapping. We think we understand what we're saying to one another, but we don't really understand what are the goals here? What are the problems that we're trying to solve? And how can we use this tool in the best way? So today we're going to talk about three of those common problems. Now, there are many, many things journey mapping can solve for you. There are many ways to leverage uh, how you use these tools. But today we're going to talk about three common ones. The first one is Siloed experiences lead to unhappy customers. It's really that simple. We all talk about being anti-silo. We talk about breaking down those silos, 
Let's talk about why we need to do that and how journey mapping can help. Organizational inefficiencies. I see this all the time. This is something that we think we understand how our organization is providing the experience, but by the act of journey mapping, we can really discover ways that we can do this in a better way for our organizations and our employees. And then finally, missed opportunities and customer abandonment. This is where the magic really happens. You can start identifying where is it that we can deliver more and better for our customers in order to uh, you know, get those business outcomes, to provide moments of delight for them, to provide those moments where they're going to then tell other people about it. All of those things are super critical to any customer experience and customer journey mapping can help us get there. So first one is the siloed experiences. When we talk about siloed experiences, what does that mean? Well, the way this shows up a lot of times is that when we are in especially large organizations, we have several different departments working on several different things. And while it may seem like the customer is going to go through that, that part of the journey in a linear fashion, we simply don't as customers, we don't, we jump around. We go from one part of the journey to the next. We might be kicking the tires on a public forum, seeing how you're responding to specific customers as you know, a lurker, we're, we're identifying things there while at the same time talking to customer service directly, we're doing all sorts of things. And I think the siloed experiences happen because when we are asking, for instance, our digital team to focus solely on the digital experience that a customer has when they are purchasing or when they are in their customer service moment, then we're not really approaching the customer journey as a holistic view. We're not really looking at it with that holistic view. Journey mapping can really help this because if you are assigned that, if you're told, okay, you digital department have to work on this uh, part of the journey, then you can use the overall mapping methods. You can look at, okay, what's happening before this for the customer? What's actually happening after? Where could they exit this and where would they go on their journey? So, you know, we we've talked about artificial intelligence on these webinars before and chatbots. Sometimes people get frustrated with chatbots and then they abandon that channel and they go somewhere else. That happens throughout the journey. And if you're not looking at things from that holistic perspective, it can be really siloed and very frustrating for the customer because then they are forced to really figure out what do I need to do next? They have to re-explain their issue. They have to reintroduce themselves. They don't feel known or recognized throughout the journey. So journey mapping can really help break down those silos and provide that cross-functional leadership we need in order to provide a holistic experience for our customers. Organizational inefficiencies. This is one of my favorite ones because sometimes we are asked as customer experience leaders, we're told, you know, how does this really do anything money-wise? And one of the best things I think we can talk about with journey mapping specifically is that the return on the investment of journey mapping is sometimes more about the internal processes. So the customer might not even see much of what's happening, but we can become more efficient on the inside. And one of my favorite stories about this, and I wrote about this in the blog, was that, you know, I was doing a journey mapping workshop with a client and I was saying, okay, what happens next? That's essentially, I ask a ton of questions in a journey mapping workshop. That's all I do is ask questions. And so I said, okay, what happens next? The customer purchases, great. What happens, you know, from that customer perspective, what happens next? And marketing said very proudly, oh, we send them this welcome kit. It's really beautiful. They get all of this information and they get a really nice letter from the president and it's signed. I said, great. And then the president's executive assistant was there and she said, well, wait a minute, we send a welcome kit directly from the president's office and with a letter from the president. And so I asked them to go find samples and bring those to the meeting. And what happened was we realized that with very good intentions, they wanted to make that moment special for the customer, but instead it was this moment of confusion and then I, I thought, okay, if I'm the customer, I'm getting this beautiful package 
that looks very expensive. And then I'm getting this other package and I'm thinking, hang on a minute, I just gave you some money and this is what you're doing with it. And so I asked the customer service lead, I said, what, you know, do you ever hear about this? And he said, you know, we did, but we thought it was a problem with duplicates. So they were going back to the people who print the material and saying, hey, stop sending out duplicates, which they were saying were not, because guess what? They were printed in two different places too. And while that that's an extreme example, there are examples like that in every organization where because we're not necessarily communicating about the customer journey, we are doing things on our own and kind of hoping for the best. So the act of journey mapping, the act of asking these questions can help us bring those organizational inefficiencies to light and then get rid of them, make it more efficient, make it more streamlined. It's better for the organization, it's better for the customer, and guess what? It saves the organization money, which is a direct line to the uh, return on the investment of doing something like this. So the other thing that I love to find are these moments of missed opportunities. This is when you can identify within your customer journey Moments that matter to your customer that maybe you're not really paying attention to. It's easy to say things like in B2B, it's very common to say, okay, first you go into sales and then we're going to hand you off to account management. Well, that's a big moment for the customer. If we are not really nurturing them in that moment, then they could just think, well, I thought I, I thought I was doing the right thing, but that buyer's remorse starts hitting right away. And they have found that within the first 90 to 100 days for B2B or long, uh, more intense sales cycles, I should say, 48 hours, if it's just a simple transaction, that's when buyer's remorse starts hitting in. Because essentially, the minute we hand over that money as customers, we start evaluating the value differently. So if we are not providing value in those super critical moments for our customers, then all it takes is a competitor who does. All it takes is a competitor who says, you know what, we're going to make this really special for you. We're going to make sure that you're engaged in that moment that you start to have those doubts. We're going to make sure we provide reassurance along the journey in those key moments. Then it's going to be that much easier for customers to just abandon you and go elsewhere. This comes up a lot when we think about disruption. Think about who the disruptors are in your market. A lot of times it's not about price, it's about the value. It's about what are they giving to the customers? And that could be, the value could be convenience. It could be ease. It could be that they feel valued. All of those things are super important. And so making sure that we're looking at these journey maps in the process of doing them and saying, okay, this is a missed opportunity. What can we do today? And sometimes it's really that simple. I worked with a construction firm who realized that you know what their sales cycle was really hard. They were building these huge things. They were building churches and schools and hospitals. So those sales cycles are tough because it takes a lot from the buyer. They have to invest. They have to make sure that they're getting what they need with the blueprints and everything else. It's a long cycle. And they do this with several different construction firms before they make their decision on who they're going with. So when they decided, they would say, okay, it's time to... Uh, you know, pick you, construction firm A, uh, the guys who were the salespeople, who are also the the foremen and the planners and everything, they would kind of say, okay, okay, let's, let's move on to the meeting. Let's do this and this. And we said, wow, what an opportunity to celebrate with our customers. And once they started doing that, they got some really nice feedback that it was such a great moment of reassurance that they had made the right choice. So looking for small moments like that, it doesn't cost anything to do that, but looking for those moments in your journey maps, you can really start identifying, okay, if we raise this up a little bit, what will that give us? Uh, and if we do something special here that our competitors aren't doing, that's a competitive advantage as well. So there are all sorts of ways that in the process of journey mapping, you can start identifying that as a group and then actually do things about it. So the key takeaways here, uh, customer journey maps are widely uh, seen as essentially deliverables, documents designed to be created and ignored. And this is getting better. And you guys have heard me talk about this, I know, but 
Sometimes you still see this where they say, okay, we need to do a journey map and you ask why. And they say, oh, I've heard it's really good because it'll give us that end to end uh, view, but then they don't use it. They simply don't use it. And it's something that has to be used. It's a tool. Let's go ahead and leverage that. So journey maps are tools and they're only useful when they're used by people who understand how to use them. So instead of just releasing the journey map to the rest of your organization and saying, here's our journey map, look at the experience, give them tips, help them understand how they can use it. Look for those opportunities for your customers. Look for those organizational inefficiencies. Look for ways that you can improve the experience. And so you will create more loyal customers at the end of the day. And why journey map? Here are just the top three problems that you can solve. But overall, you guys could come up with your own list here. You could actually say, you know what? We've had problems with product development. We've released products that have been too buggy or our customers don't like it and our customer service gets overloaded. Well, that's something you could say, okay, let's journey map this. Let's figure out what is it that we can do to provide a better experience for our customers? How can we reduce those inefficiencies? How can we make sure that proactively we are releasing something that won't end up costing us on the service side of things? So I encourage you to brainstorm with your teams and think about, okay, what problems do we need to solve? And then apply the journey maps to solving those problems as that tool because they are not just about one thing. Customer journey maps are, are able to do a lot of different things if we use them the right way. And ultimately, they are a way to understand our customers, which is the first step in any improvement that we need to do. We need to understand our customers and their real experience from their perspective, not the process maps that we have internally but their perspective from the outside in. And really they're tools to find opportunities. And when we talk about business innovation, when we talk about these big ideas, this is what it's about. It's not necessarily about throwing everything out and starting over. It's about these incremental improvements we can make to make the journey better for our customers on an ongoing basis. It's an evolution, uh, sometimes as much as a revolution, right? So. Make sure that we're really looking at what are those opportunities and how can we deliver on them? And then using that tool over and over and over again to really serve our customers. So I would ask you, how are your journey maps being used today? What are ways that you envision using them as tools for the future? And with that, I'd love to open it up to some questions. All right. So uh, first, let's jump in with a couple comments here. We've got a great comment from Keith. He says, your comments about understanding the journey reminds me of the book, Don't Make Me Think. Uh, if we make our customers cognitive effort too much, their loyalty and trust declines. Yes, and that's a great book. Everybody should read that book. Uh, <laughs> and it, it really is because it really does get to the core of the effort issue. Sometimes I think we look at customer effort as, okay, do they need to call too many people? Do they need to um, you know, wait on hold? All these different things. But, and again, you guys have heard me say these this last few weeks, but there is a cognitive load on all of us right now that we have to be aware of. And it's taking away some of that mental bandwidth that we're used to as people, like as high performing people, it is bizarre not to have some of that bandwidth that we're used to. But at the same time, we all have this mental and emotional load right now just because, you know, 2020. Uh, <laughs> and so I think it's a really important point to make that the more we can reduce the effort on on just what they're what they're thinking about and make it as easy for them as possible. It's a huge thing to do for your customers right now. Mm -hmm. I want to highlight another comment. This one's from a, an anonymous LinkedIn user. Uh, he says, or he or she says, the internal education around CX and journeys is prevalent in many, many orgs. Many don't understand why they need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, and you know, I've seen this show up where um, there's there's one I'm thinking about right now who basically every time I talk about journey maps, she says, oh, we've done journey maps, but they haven't. They've done process maps. They've done internal process maps. And then they've kind of 
taped them together and they've called that the journey map, but that's not a journey map. So there is a lot of education that needs to happen around this. And there's a lot of over communication in some ways we need to do to really show the value to make sure everybody understands that it is a tool to use. Mm -hmm. uh, and I threw up a, a link to the resource center. There's a relatively recent article that you wrote, Jeannie, about how to get buy-in mm -hmm. from leaders mm -hmm. for CX initiatives. And, and so much of that is just how do we convey that it actually really is important? Yep. Um, all right, let's get to some questions. Um, so Sophia asks, within the B2B sector, things become more complex. Do you have any interesting cases from that sector? Any good examples mm. that you can throw out? B2B is, uh, is fun <laughs> because there are layers, right? You might have a distribution channel. You might have suppliers that you need to involve. Uh, you might have a different buyer from the end user. And so there are all sorts of different factors that we have to consider for B2B. What I always recommend for B2B is, first of all, you have to educate within your organization that even though it's technically a business that's a customer, um, your, your people at that business are still your customers because they are still the ones who have to jump through the hoops. I mean, some of what we do in B2B boggles my mind. The way we force, we force our customers sometimes to go through our processes for things like invoices or things like um, onboarding. It's so painful. And it just seems like we are thinking like this is um, sometimes businesses feel like, OK, well, they're, you know, now that they've decided to work with us, we can do whatever we want with them. And it can feel that way. It can it can put people into really awkward positions. So. The first thing I always say is let's look at B2B and think about what are three ways, just pick three. What are three things you can do to make your customers' lives easier? And nine out of 10 times, this has to do with invoicing. I will say that. The other thing it has to do with 100% of the time is communication. We over communicate the wrong things. We communicate as if um, they are not people and we're not people and there's zero emotion, and that doesn't serve anybody either. We don't give people escape valves, meaning that they get an email saying, you must renew by so-and-so, and it says, press this button, and the button doesn't work, and there's no one to call, and we don't give them any avenues. There are so many ways that we can look at the B2B journey and just create better experiences across the board. So B2B can get very, very complex. Don't get me wrong. It can get very complex. So what I always recommend is start with one journey map. Start with the one that you can kind of get your arms around in the best possible way. You can start figuring out what data you have available and what data you, you need. You can, it's kind of like a practice run. And then once you have that journey map and you start seeing the value of that, you can layer on top of that. So maybe you start with your um, buyers and then you move into your end users or you layer on that distribution channel or anything that you need to do. So I totally agree that B2B is different, but at the same time, it's still people. And we have to remember that there are still people making these decisions. There are still people deciding, do I want to be your customer or not? And disruption happens in B2B too. I mean, we've seen this, right? We were just talking a while ago about how uh, you know, 10 years ago, the only way to really have a video conference, it felt like was like Skype or some of these other uh, early, early options. And then all of a sudden, all of those kind of fell out of favor because of the disruptors in the market. So when you think about B2B, don't fool yourself into thinking like, we're good. Our, our customers are locked in because they're never locked in. They always have choice and customer journey mapping can really help you make that case throughout your organization that, you know what, we need to invest in a better way to communicate, or we need to invest in a better way to invoice our customers so that they feel valued, so that they remain loyal. Journey mapping can help with all of that. That was a really long answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can talk about it to be a long time. <laughs> I enjoyed it. 
Um, and we've got a great conversation going on in the chat as well. Um, Sophia actually responded to her question with a comment to say that she uses uh, Journey Maps to identify multiple unique touch points within marketing to help create better and more relevant marketing. Um, and then Keith added that he recently mapped and uh, they're figuring out metrics to monitor for new businesses uh, within their first year to help with retention. Love it, love yeah. it. Great, great examples. Um, so let's get to the next question. I love this one. Uh, so Ahmad asks, the main challenge that I face is who creates the map? If it's the organization, how do we guarantee we're not missing any touch points? Love this question. Uh, yeah, so touch points, I, I push back a little when people are like, we're, we're going to capture every single touch point. Uh, no, we're not. We're not. We're going to hopefully keep adding to it. We're hopefully going to keep discovering different ways and and keep adding to that uh, inventory of touch points. But none of us are perfect at this. And I think you know, I I like to think about it as a a different a couple different phases when you're journey mapping. The first one is you do have to start inside usually because you have to figure out what are your goals. What are you trying to do with this map? Why are you doing it? And you know what outcomes do you really need? So that has to kind of come from the inside. And then you start figuring out what do we already know? And I say that because I think sometimes we don't give ourselves credit, but I have been to so many journey mapping workshops where I say, okay, if we could change one thing for customers, if customers had a magic wand, what would they ask us to do? And like 90% of the people will say the same thing. We all know some of those issues already. So that can help uh, give that map some focus and some direction. But when you're starting on the inside, you really are starting with hypotheses. You're starting with ideas that you believe are true, but you need to validate those. So it's really important to include customers as you build this map. You have to make sure that you are bringing in customer data and feedback that you are allowing them points where they can proactively give that feedback as well and that you're really listening to that. And then eventually you wanna bring customers in to validate the map with you, to actually create their own version of a map and see if that lines up with your hypotheses. Sometimes I know people uh, resist that because they're like, oh, it's so hard to get customers involved. In this virtual world, it can be done a lot easier in some ways than before. So instead of bringing a whole bunch of customers into a conference room, you can actually reach out and say, hey, we want to know about your experience when you were doing this. And there are some great tools. I've mentioned these before, but CX Workout is one of my favorites where they can actually say to customers, take pictures, take videos, provide that as part of the map. And so you really get that perspective from the customer. So there are several ways to bring in that customer voice and it's a critical, critical piece. But as far as you you do the best you can with collecting the touch points. And then one of the things that I really believe is vital to customer experience leadership is humility to listen, to see that, you know what, we totally missed that one or we had no idea that was bothering customers. We have to constantly have that open-mindedness and have our radar up so that when we see something that we left off the map, we can say, oh, you know what? We, we did our best, but we missed this. And so we're going to go back. A, a, a recent example of this was working with a client and they realized that they hadn't really thought about the experience for customers with disabilities. And so that became a huge missing piece because of what they did. And so we were able to go back and, and use the map that we were working on, but then add those touch points in and really make sure that we were representative of those customers as well. And we invited them into the process and said, okay, share with us, what is this like? Come in and tell us, uh, how would you do this differently? What can we do to support you? All of these things. And we were able to get you know a whole other layer of touch points and it's something that it it happens. Um, so I think the first thing is don't guarantee we're going to find every touch point because it's it's harder than it sounds. Because I really think of touch points as every single interaction that a customer has with a brand. Some people classify those differently, but it's not just about the channel. It's not saying like, oh, if somebody calls in, this is the experience. It's about, okay, if they call in and then it drops, if they call in and they get a different agent, if they call in all of those we have to think through all of those scenarios. And that's what makes this work so challenging, but also so rewarding because 
you start seeing things that you can improve for people and you start seeing that it has a meaningful impact on their lives. And I think that's what we all get excited about as customer experience leaders. Great, thanks to uh, Ahmad for the great question. Good to see you here again as well. Um, there's a great conversation going on in the chat. I'm not even going to try to read all of the comments, but I'm, I'm very happy to see uh, all of the, the great conversation going on there. Um, so thanks Saptarshi, thanks Cho Kim uh, and others for, for your contributions there. Um, let's jump ahead to the next question. This one's from Ramiro. Uh, how do you usually connect ROI to the journey steps? Any tips? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've written about this recently too. And of course I'm blanking on which blog, but we'll figure that out. <laughs> uh, this is what happens when I when I write week after week. Uh, but essentially what I like to do is think about, okay, what are you, uh, you know, what, what thread can you pull? And what I mean by that is we know certain things about certain metrics. So we know that for instance, in certain industries, if you have NPS, uh, net promoter score, you can start identifying, okay, this much of an increase in net promoter score actually means this much increase in renewals or in retention or in these different things. So you have to kind of draw those dotted lines between the CX metric that you're tracking and the, um, the business outcome metric that you want to see improve. So there are different ways of doing this and it depends on the industry a little bit. But the most important thing is to start tracking because then you can start identifying those, those trends and you can start seeing things like, okay, we noticed that uh, we had, you know, again, this is a software example, but we had a software release that went really poorly, right? You know, tons of complaints from customers. It was one of the worst rollouts we've ever had. So what does that do to uh, referral rates? probably brings them down, right? People are not going to refer when they don't have confidence in the last rollout. So by addressing that in customer experience, by looking at, okay, we know that uh, by investing in the proactive customer experience of a rollout, we can prevent some of that uh, madness from happening where we know we can get better referral rates. We know we can get better retention and renewal rates. That's what you have to start identifying the individual touch points. Sometimes that's hard to draw that line. But what, what I would do is look at, okay, if we do X, does that improve Y? So if we improve, for instance, if we, if we take our, for instance, the hold time of somebody who's calling in for um, help in a contact center, if we bring that time down, does that improve the transactional uh, customer satisfaction score they give us at the end of that call? Probably does. But you have to start looking at those things and tying those things together and watch for those trends. It's really hard to do if you just dabble, if you just kind of look at it and go, oh, that's interesting for this month. You have to really track over time so you can start identifying what are those levers that we need to pull in order to get those better results. We've got a question from uh, Matthew. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, but I'm really excited to dig into this because it's something that coming from a marketing background, we always talk about too. Um, he says, we help a bank to monitor its customer journey and we've identified that it's very difficult to reciliate for customers. Uh, they don't have any form or telephone number uh, for customers to, to leave. So this is a heavy pain point identified by them but the bank says, okay, well, if we solve this, we lose a lot of money. So how do you balance creating, making it convenient uh, for customers to exit while also hanging on to them as much as possible and, and getting that income? This is a great question. This comes up a lot in software. It also comes up in things like fitness. Um, I a couple of years ago, I don't know if this is totally true anymore, but a couple of years ago uh, with gyms, many of them stopped sending member newsletters or any member communication because they realized that it prompted some of their members to think, oh, I'm not using the gym as much as I thought I would and I'm going to cancel. And while that sounds reasonable, um, it's really, it's, it's not. And 
sometimes this is the hard work. And this is what I say are some of the hard truths of customer experience. Sometimes you just have to do what's right, even if that means that short term, it can be painful. But customer experience is a long term game. It's something that we have to look at as we are going to reap the rewards of treating our customers well, so that we can then get those longer term relationships, they will be more likely to refer by having a good experience at the end. So this comes up a lot in software as well, where, where the automatic renewals and automatic things happen and then customers call to complain and they're told, oh, sorry, you've got to wait 365 days because that's the rule. Um, customers then take that kind of negativity and anger and what do they do with it? They tell everybody about it. They go on those forums. They, they uh, leave those horrible reviews that we've all seen. And so I think we really need to think about this as what is it we're trying to do? Are we trying to hold customers hostage? I don't think we are, but that's essentially what happens when we when we make decisions like this. So I always encourage people to think about, okay, think about the, this is a little bit out there, but think about the uh, exes that you have that you're still friendly with, right? Think about how those ended compared to the ones where you never want to see them again and it's horrible. It's because a lot of it is because of the way it ends. And we want people to still be friendly with us. We want them to have good feelings about us. We want them, if they're not using the gym, we want them to say to their neighbor, well, oh, you, you're looking for a gym? Well, I really liked mine. I just didn't have enough time, but you should go see them. Um, that is really meaningful. And I think customers are super savvy now about how these games are played. And they really don't appreciate being, you know, controlled that way. And they are willing to go out and tell the world about it. And so that's the argument that we need to make is that we need our customers out there with positive word of mouth referrals instead of bad mouthing us every single chance they get and convincing other prospects why they shouldn't be a customer, because that's essentially what happens. That's great. We've got a question from Tammy. Uh, Tammy asks, when I use journey mapping, I always link KPIs to the journey and MOTs. This is when people across the org usually get the importance. It's also the most difficult thing to identify uh, in terms of KPIs. Any tips you found to help others in that area? Mm -hmm. oh, it is hard. Uh, I will say that. I think that's a big part of it. One of the things that I look for when and KPIs are key performance indicators and MOTs are moments of truth, just to let everybody in on the lingo in case you're not uh, geeking out with all of us. Uh, so when I look at KPIs within the journey, one of the things I, I always start with um, the cost savings. I start with like, what are we going to do for the organization that will help reduce cost? Because that is sometimes easier to prove and easier to move the needle on. So for instance, if you can identify, okay, we've got uh, we've got X number of calls coming in complaining about this point in the journey. If you can solve that point in the journey and then lower the amount of complaints coming into your contact center, that will reduce your contact center costs. Um, so that's one thing I like to do is look at what can we do for the organization from that cost savings perspective, just because it, sometimes it's a little easier. The other thing around KPIs that I look at are how, you know, we know through lots of research now, through lots of different methods, we know how important emotion is to decision making. We know that customers will make decisions based on emotion, not just customers, all of us humans do this. And so we, if we can identify key points in the journey that are emotional triggers, that are those moments of truth. And we can say, okay, if we can improve this, if we can turn this frown upside down, then that means that they are actually going to spend more money with us long-term, or they are actually going to uh, be more open to those upsell opportunities or whatever it is. So that's what I like to do is look at um, how can we zero in on that cost savings first as a KPI, because that will speak to all of your leaders. They'll, they'll get that. And then how do we look at those emotional points and start really identifying 
what is the next decision they need to make as a customer and how will a better emotional state impact that? And those are, um, I know that sounds a little esoteric to talk about emotion, but it, if, if you can really zero in on that, then you can start kind of predicting the next decisions that they're going to make with your organization. And those can become some of your KPIs too. Uh, all right, here's a great question. When is it a good time to start considering doing a roadmap? Well, let's see, are we talking a product roadmap or uh, maybe is this about the journey map? Let's let's assume this is about the journey map. Um, anytime, <laughs> that's my answer. But I think, you know, we journey mapping can be a great uh, parallel tool when you are doing something like a product roadmap, when you are starting to talk about product development or new ideas around innovation and things like that. So parallel to that can be a really helpful resource because you proactively think about the customer experience instead of trying to retroactively look at it. So that's one thing I would say. The other thing is uh, I, I think we have to stop thinking about journey mapping as, okay, we, we're gonna go through this cycle um, we're going to fix these things and then talk to you in six months, everybody, or a year or two years when we do this all over again. In an ideal world, you're just constantly kind of reviewing the journey map. You're incorporating it into your work. You're making sure that other people do it. And I, I also um, really am a big believer that you don't have to make it this huge end-to-end -end thing. It can be a small part of your journey if you want to explore what happens when you know, we've heard a lot of complaints lately about our contact center when people call in about this one issue. What actually happens there? Map that out. That can be really powerful. I call that micro mapping. And it's where you really dig in to the minutia about one kind of section of your customer's journey. That can be really helpful too. So there are so many different ways to do it. I don't think there's a perfect time. I don't think there's a perfect result. I don't think there's a perfect map. I know this is blasphemous, but I think it's more about the act of doing it. It's about keeping the lens of your customer front and center and making sure we're constantly checking in with their experience, with their actual reality and with their perspective. So that's that's when I would do it. If you were asking about a different type of roadmap, go ahead and let us know if I got that right. Uh, let's jump over to a question that came in via email. Um, and just as a reminder, this is a great time to remind everybody, uh, you can send in your questions via email or um, via the website, experienceinvestigators.com ahead of time. And uh, we'll make sure to get to those in these Q and A's. So this is a question from a junior CX associate in an international company, a large international organization. Uh, and they ask, how do you address cultural and regional silos to create CX buy-in throughout the organization? This is a great question. And it's something a lot of us uh, deal with when we're um, either within international organizations or we are starting to expand um, culture and region. Um, they, they have an impact on the customer journey. And so it is very, very important to make sure that we are addressing the specific needs around different cultures, around different regions, around even things like, okay, we're international, how do we deal with time zones? All of those things are really important. So as far as buy-in, and I think this question was really asking about if you're a little bit spread out as an organization, if you're a little bit um, disjointed, how do you get buy-in? And what I recommend is that you really start looking at, okay, what can you control? right? So start there and start with, okay, if I know that I have a great relationship with my leadership team, um, I'm going to start there. And then I'm going to ask for their help, getting that up to that next layer, getting that across the organization, creating that cross-functional team. I think we sometimes try to boil the ocean with customer experience. We try to put everything out there and hope for the best, right? We say, okay, everybody, it's everybody's job now. Customer experience is your job. So so come on, get on board. And we don't really allow the communication to take hold. We don't really allow people to internalize what we're really doing. Because if they've been taught a certain way for decades, how to look at business, 
And suddenly we come along and we say, no, no, that's all wrong. We have to look at the customer's perspective when they've literally never thought about it. That's a big uphill battle to climb. And so start where you are and do what you can, because there are times where you can start creating I, you know, you've heard me say this before too, but you can start creating kind of lieutenants and ambassadors throughout your organization. Start looking for those people who already get it and say to them, hey, I know we work in different departments, but I'm looking for people to help me get this message across. Would you be willing to help me with that? And I've seen people get really, really creative with this. They send out swag. They uh, do things like they have uh, weekly trivia about different customers just to get people engaged. There are all sorts of different ways, but I would encourage you to, instead of thinking about, okay, how do we get this all the way up to the organizational leadership and how do we do this right within a couple months? Think about what you can do as a change agent in your world and then start there, start uh, showing those quick wins, showing those uh, returns on the investment of customer experience, even if that's customer stories. We've talked about this before too. People internalize stories. Hear a great story, share that, see what happens and say, you know, I think this happened because we implemented this or because we started training this way and start connecting those dots more um, explicitly for people when they need to hear that. So it's it's a it's a challenge, but I also think it's an opportunity to really do what we can where we are. Let's close it out with a question that Jeannie, of course, you're welcome to answer. But I also want to just throw this to everybody. Um, now I've lost it. Uh, here we go. <laughs> uh, what are your favorite books mm. about or around customer journey mapping? Mm -hmm. There are quite a few out there. Um, well, first of all. Hey, I've got a course or two on this, <laughs> so I'll say that, uh, which are hands-on for LinkedIn Learning, if you are interested. Uh, but Jim Tinter has a book called uh, How Hard Is It to Be Your Customer? I hope I just quoted that right. Um, that's that's a really good journey mapping book. Um, my friend Annette Franz came out with a book called uh, Customer Understanding. That has some good tips in it as well. And so those, those are two of my favorites. If you want to get a little more esoteric, uh, the... Power of Moments by Chip and Dan Heath. I hope I'm getting these titles right. I'm doing it off the top of my head. Um, and that one is one of my favorite books because it really does talk about how important uh, things are in the moment. And that's something I really believe in and I write a lot about a lot. So I like that one as well. Uh, and uh, there, there's another, this is an older book, but I've brought this up before too. It's more about communication. It's not about journey mapping, but it's called The Leader's Voice. And one of the things I really believe in is that when we're talking about journey mapping, a big part of it is communication. We have to break through to different people who think differently in order to get the outcomes we want. And so when we are looking at um, how do we present the map? I think communication is super important. The Leader's Voice is one of my favorites. I don't even know if it's in print anymore. It was written by a couple guys uh, with the um, Tom Peters group, I think. But uh, w the piece that really stuck with me all these years later is that we really interpret information through three different areas, which is emotion, logic, and symbolism. And some of us want more logic and some of us want more emotion and some of us want more symbolism, but we all need all three in order to really internalize things. And so that's a book that I, I really like as well. Boyd Clark was one of the authors. He's passed away, um, but he was he was one of them. And there's a co-author and I can't remember his name right now. I'm sorry, but uh, I really like that book as well. And if you are interested in a course, uh, we've got links right down there uh, in the ticker to uh, all of Jeannie's LinkedIn learning courses as well. I just, I just noticed Tyler mentioned Mapping Experiences by James Callback, which I should have remembered because I'm actually in that book. <laughs> so don't bring <laughs> that up. <laughs> yes, get that book and look for Jeannie. Um, great. So uh, I think that's going to do it for us today. I don't think we have any more questions. So Jeannie, where can people find you? Yeah, let me. Uh, oh, yeah, I've got to share again. Wow, this is, 
I got so into these questions today. I know. Great. It was really. Um, uh, well, I'll go ahead and add a little add a little note here while you're pulling that up. Mm -hmm. That um, you know we love getting your feedback and hearing uh, not only how these sessions are going for you, but also what you would like to hear about and learn about in the future. So you can go to bit.ly/letgenie know and uh, let us know how this is going for you, and that absolutely helps us shape the content of these. So we really appreciate it. Yes, thank you. We love hearing from you in all the different ways. So keep that feedback coming. And if you do have any uh, suggestions for these, we, we really do wanna hear how would this be valuable for you? Because that's why we're here. So feel free to reach me. You can email me, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and of course, LinkedIn as well. So we, we love hearing from you. I love connecting with those of you who afterwards reach out to me on LinkedIn and say, hey, I just was on your webinar and wanted to connect. Love hearing from you in that way too. So keep that up. And as always, I wanna thank you for your dedication to your customers. The goal of my company, the mission, my personal mission is to create fewer ruined days for customers because I really believe that makes a better world if we can make everybody's day a little brighter and you guys help me do that. So thank you for helping me live my mission and thank you for being here week after week. We always appreciate the, the thoughtful and knowledgeable experiences that you bring to this conversation. And I just, uh, I really appreciate the community that we're forming here. It's really exciting. So remember next week, I won't be here live. I hope you get a chance to take a little time off uh, during the summer months too. And uh, we will still have programming about how to plan for the rest of 2020. So watch for that. And in the meantime, stay well and thanks again. <laughs>